I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens as you age. Some people think that everyone gets dementia as they get old. Not true at all. There's some very sharp 80 and 90 year old people. It's not inevitable. With normal aging, you may forget part of an experience, but you eventually remember it. But with dementia, you might forget the entire experience and never remember it. Instructions and notes to yourself are helpful in normal aging. I know I use them. But with dementia, the notes aren't very helpful. People with dementia will take a shopping list and they'll forget to look at the shopping list. But the bottom line with dementia is, can you take care of yourself? And the, when the activities of daily living are no longer possible, then that's true dementia. And then you require those caretaker to help you. And whether it's a relative, a friend, a neighbor, or a professional, it's going to be a lot of work to take care of someone with dementia. And it's also a huge economic burden a lot of, for a lot of families. This is a little bit technical, but it's good to have a little bit of science in the crowd. The first graph on the left, it's kind of orange, shows you the buildup of amyloid plaque and note that it happens decades before dementia actually occurs. You can see on the bottom where it says dementia over there. Um, so this line comes up here. Long before dementia occurs, the amyloid plaque is built up almost to its maximum level. That's why we're not so sure how much it's involved, but I'll tell you more about that. Now, the tau tangles are a better indicator. That's this green line here. Tau tangles parallel the brain cell death, and those two go together. But we can help with brain cell death. We can load our brains up with antioxidants, and we can quit eating the foods that are damaging and destroying our brain cells. So we have some control over that. Cognition, which is the purple line here, this starts to be problematic at the beginning of mild cognitive impairment. And then at the end of mild cognitive impairment, it's really getting to be a problem. Now, mild cognitive impairment is kind of in between normal aging and dementia. And it's really a broad pattern, because when you first enter mild cognitive impairment, well, you're nearly normal for your age. But when you exit mild cognitive impairment, you're actually in dementia. So the brain has already shrunk by about 10%. We don't want it to shrink to 50%, so that's why I'm here tonight. Tau tangles already in the brain, and the amyloid plaques are in the brain. Memory and thinking is becoming difficult, but in mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, it's still easy enough to take care of yourself, and you don't need help. Mild cognitive impairment tends to lead to dementia. It can be seen as the precursor to dementia. So as you see the graph on the left over here, Little by little, people graduate to dementia from mild cognitive impairment, perhaps 10% a year. Estimates vary, different populations vary. But if people continue to do what they're doing when they got mild cognitive impairment, then it's more or less inevitable that they will sooner or later progress to dementia. But we can change our habits. And that's why I'm here today, is to help you change our habits. People in our trial change their habits, and instead of being just below dementia, they became quite normal. This is a scale of the mini mental status exam. 20 is kind of the cutoff point for dementia. 25 is the cutoff point for mild cognitive impairment. And this area between 25 and 30 is the normal area. And missing one of the 30 questions is not abnormal at all. That happens, it can happen to anyone. Uh, so how did we do it? What did we do? to make this happen. Well, first you get a pretty picture to rest your brains and eyes. Here are the 16 interventions. Now, when I proposed this trial, the scientists I worked with, our statistician said, no, you're supposed to test one chemical, not 16 diverse things. But my goal was to say, can we reverse dementia? So I wanted to put in all the 16 best things that I had seen evidence for in clinical trials. Randomized, controlled clinical trials from all over the world have shown me that each of these different changes are very helpful. So among the dietary changes, 
one cup of berries daily. Is there anyone here who already eats one cup of berries daily? Great. Anyone here is willing to start eating one cup of berries daily? I'll show you a study later. Great, fantastic. That shows that an average of two years delayed dementia just with one cup of berries a day and no other interventions. So we specified for our people blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes. Now blueberries and strawberries are very low in glycemic load, so even people with diabetes seem to be okay with that. It does not increase blood sugar a lot. But they're loaded with enormously helpful antioxidants, anthocyanins, and so on. Walnuts and sunflower seeds were chosen because walnuts are loaded with a gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E. And sunflower seeds are just loaded with the alpha tocopherol form of vitamin E. So by combining the two, we're really covering the bases on that essential element, vitamin E. Now because the study was done with people 65 years or better, as I like to say, uh, some of these people had diverticuli, bile pockets, and their doctors forbid them to eat any nuts or seeds. So we had people simply put the nuts in, into a coffee grinder, buzz them up into powder, and then eat them that way without heating. So that meant that everyone could take them. Also, you get a much better digestion of the nutrients inside the nuts and seeds if you grind them up, because your digestive activity can hit all parts of, of it instead of there being little microscopic mountains that aren't chewed up inside there. We changed cooking methods, and this was to prevent the formation of advanced glycation end products, which I'll tell you about. We also lowered the saturated fat in the diet, and that was the toughest thing that we did. Uh, there was a lot of noncompliance on lowering saturated fat in diet because that means eating less animal fat, and animal fat's a real favorite of people in Hawaii, and I imagine it is here in New York, too. Okay, we used uh, quite a few supplements. There's four antioxidant minerals that I'll explain. We used a mixed form of vitamin E to supplement the nuts and seeds. We used vitamin C to boost the antioxidant power in the body. We also used coenzyme Q10, which has two effects. One is it's necessary for production of aerobic energy in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. It's essential. And it's also known as ubiquinone. It's ubiquitous everywhere in the body. But as we age, we tend to produce a little less of this coenzyme Q10. So it's very safe, natural in the body, and so we did supplement with that. We also used the folate, uh, the real form of folate, not folic acid, the synthetic form. Folate is safe. The folic acid form has some potential for raising cancer risk if over 1,000 micrograms a day. We used vitamin C and um, Vitamin B12, now folate and vitamin B12 work together, and I'll show you how that works as we go along. We use SAMe. Does anyone know about s methionine? Yeah, this is naturally made in our bodies if we have enough folate and vitamin B12, but just like the vitamin E, we wanted to do it two different ways because it's so important. Guess what this stuff does? Those genes that everyone's talking about, creating Alzheimer's plaques, and some people have more of those genes, this quenches them. It quiets them. It puts them to sleep. So they no longer make the enzymes that make Alzheimer's plaque. 